You know, before we had things like evidence or the scientific method, science was basically just a game of confident guesses. And those guesses got weird, like life popping out of a loaf of bread weird. Today we're diving into the absolute strangest, most bizarre, and hilariously wrong scientific theories that humanity once took as gospel. Let's get into it. First up is the wonderfully bizarre theory of spontaneous generation. For the better part of 2,000 years, it was just accepted scientific fact that life could appear out of non-living stuff. We've got a pile of old, dirty rags and some wheat in a corner. Don't be surprised if you come back in a few weeks and find a family of mice has just um, generated. Got some rotting meat? Well, that's just a maggot factory waiting to happen. And this wasn't some old wives' tale. It was formalized by none other than Aristotle himself. He proposed that non-living matter contained a vital heat, or pneuma, and if the conditions were right, poof, life. To be fair, without microscopes, you can kind of see how they got there. You leave food out, and suddenly it's crawling with life. But it really does seem to appear from nothing. This idea was so powerful it stuck around for centuries, even after scientists like Francesco Reddy showed in 1668 that if you covered meat to keep flies away, no maggots would appear. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that the theory was finally put to bed for good, most famously by Louis Pasteur. In a brilliant experiment, he used a special swan neck flask. He boiled broth inside it, killing any existing microbes, but the flask's shape allowed air to get in while trapping airborne dust and spores in its curved neck. The broth stayed perfectly sterile, but as soon as he tipped the flask to let the trapped gunk touch the broth, it exploded with life. He proved that life comes from, well, other life. A concept so fundamental, we now call it the law of biogenesis. Next on our tour of bad ideas is the miasma theory of disease, which basically held that the world's deadliest illnesses were caused by a bad smell. For centuries, people believed that diseases like cholera and the plague were spread by miasma, a noxious form of bad air that oozed out of rotting organic matter. If you lived in a 19th century city like London, this almost made a twisted sort of sense. The streets were filled with waste, and the River Thames was basically an open sewer. These places stank, and they were also hotbeds of disease. So people connected the dots. Foul smells must equal sickness. The proposed solution? Carry around flowers, burn incense, and generally try to overpower the bad air with nice smells. Medicine was essentially a bottle of Febreze and a prayer. The theory started to fall apart during the London cholera outbreaks of the 1850s. A doctor named John Snow, wait, no, not that one, was deeply skeptical of the miasma theory. He did something revolutionary, huh? He mapped the cholera cases and discovered they were all clustered around a single public water pump on Broad Street. He argued the disease was spreading through contaminated water, not bad air. To prove it, he famously convinced the local council to remove the handle from the pump and the outbreak in that area ground to a halt. But even with this powerful evidence, the medical establishment clung to the miasma theory. It took the work of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch to firmly establish the germ theory that specific microbes cause specific diseases for miasma to finally be aired out. At number six is a theory that ran Western medicine for over 2,000 years. Humorism, or the theory of the four humors, put forth by ancient Greek physicians like Hippocrates and later championed by the Roman physician Galen, this theory said the human body was filled with four basic liquids, or humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Your health and even your personality was all about the balance of these four fluids. If you were healthy, it meant your humors were in perfect harmony. But if you had too much or too little of one, you'd get sick. For instance, too much phlegm was linked to cold and moisture, so it might give you a winter cough. Too much yellow bile, a hot and dry humor, could make you choleric or hot-tempered. The treatments were all about rebalancing these humors. Got a fever. That's probably an excess of blood, which is hot and wet. The logical cure? Bloodletting. Have a cold? That's excess phlegm, cold and wet, so you should eat something hot and dry, like peppers. For centuries, medicine revolved around bleeding, purging, and making patients vomit to get things back in whack. It wasn't until the 18th and 19th centuries, with the rise of modern anatomy and germ theory, that doctors finally realized our bodies aren't just squishy bags of color-coded goo. Our fifth strangest theory is about a ghost that lived inside anything that could burn. It's called the phlogiston theory. Back in the 17th and 18th centuries, scientists were trying to answer a basic question. Why do things burn? The leading explanation was that combustible materials contained an invisible, odorless, and weightless substance called phlogiston, basically the element of fire. When you burned wood, you weren't destroying it. 
you were just releasing its phlogiston into the air. What was left behind was the deflagisticated substance, or ash. This explained not just fire, but also why metals rust, which they saw as a really slow burn. Something that burned easily, like charcoal, was supposedly jam-packed with phlogiston. The theory seemed to explain a lot, but it had one giant glaring problem. When you burned certain metals, they gained weight, which made zero sense if they were supposed to be losing phlogiston. Proponents tried to patch this logical hole by suggesting phlogiston had negative weight, uh, which, yeah, only made things more confusing. The whole idea finally went up in smoke in the 1770s, when the brilliant chemist Antoine Lavoisier conducted a series of meticulous experiments. He discovered a new gas he named oxygen and proved that combustion wasn't about releasing a mythical substance, but was a chemical reaction with oxygen. All right, we are halfway through our list of science gone wrong. From smelly air causing plagues to fire ghosts, it's been a wild ride. But what's the strangest theory you've ever heard that we haven't covered? Drop it in the comments below. I have a feeling there are some truly wild ones out there. Now, back to the list. At number four, we have a classic case of cosmic main character syndrome, geocentrism. For over 1,500 years, this was the model of the universe, and its premise was simple. The Earth is the stationary center of everything, and the sun, moon, planets, and stars all revolve around us. This model was most famously refined by the astronomer Ptolemy around 150 CE. His Ptolemaic system was incredibly complex for its time. It had to be, because planets don't move in perfect circles. They sometimes look like they're slowing down, speeding up, or even moving backward, a phenomenon called retrograde motion. To account for this, Ptolemy's model had the planets moving in tiny circles called epicycles, which in turn moved along bigger circles around the Earth. It was a clunky, beautiful mess, but it worked well enough to predict planetary positions for centuries. Of course, the idea that we were the center of creation was also very appealing philosophically and theologically. It took a true revolution to knock us off our pedestal. In the 16th century, Nicholas Copernicus proposed a much simpler sun-centered model. His idea was initially met with skepticism, but over the next century, the observations of astronomers like Galileo Galilei and Johannes Kepler's laws of planetary motion hammered the final nails into the coffin of the geocentric model. We weren't the center of the universe, after all. We were just another planet orbiting the sun. Next up at number three is the theory of the luminiferous ether a substance that was once thought to be the cosmic jello filling the entire universe. In the 19th century, physicists knew that waves needed a medium, sound waves travel through air, ocean waves travel through water. So they figured light waves must also need something to travel through the vacuum of space. They called this invisible, frictionless, and totally undetectable substance the luminiferous ether. The Earth, orbiting the sun, should be rushing through this ether, creating an ether wind, like the wind you feel when you stick your hand out of a moving car. In 1887, two American physicists, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley, set out to detect this wind. They built an ingenious device called an interferometer that split a beam of light, sent the two halves in different directions, and then recombined them. If the ether wind was real, it should slow down one of the light beams, creating a specific pattern. They set their experiment up on a massive stone slab floating in mercury to stop any vibrations. They ran it over and over at all times of day in different seasons. The result was always the same. Nothing. They found no difference in the speed of light, no matter which way it was traveling. This null result became one of the most famous failed experiments in history and deeply confused scientists. The ether just wasn't there. It took Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity in 1905 to finally explain why. Light doesn't need a medium because its speed is a universal constant. Space is just empty. Our runner-up for the strangest theory is the wild idea that our planet is completely hollow. The hollow earth theory has popped up for centuries, suggesting that instead of a solid core, the earth is a hollow shell with entire civilizations, monsters, or maybe even a tiny sun living inside. While mostly the stuff of folklore and fiction, like Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth, the idea was proposed as a serious scientific hypothesis a few times. In the 17th century, the astronomer Edmund Halley, yes, the Halley's comet guy, suggested the Earth was a series of concentric shells, all nested inside each other like a Russian doll, and that each might even be inhabited. He even proposed that the aurora borealis was just gas escaping from the interior. In the 19th century, an American army officer named John Cleves Sims Jr. became the theory's biggest fan. He believed the Earth was a hollow shell with huge openings at the North and South Poles, and dedicated his life to getting an expedition funded to go find one. 
He never succeeded. And of course, modern seismology and our understanding of gravity have shown that the Earth is very much solid. Still, you have to admire the sheer audacity of believing there's a secret world just waiting to be discovered right under our feet. And finally, at number one, we have the theory so famously wrong, it's become the poster child for debunked ideas, the flat Earth. Belief is simple. Earth isn't a globe, but a flat, disc-shaped plane with the North Pole at its center and a giant ice wall. Antarctica around the rim to keep the oceans from spilling off. Now, here's a massive misconception that everyone in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat until Columbus proved them wrong. That's actually a myth cooked up in the 19th century, largely by author Washington Irving. In reality, the knowledge that the Earth was a sphere has been around since at least the ancient Greeks. Around 500 BCE, thinkers like Pythagoras figured out Earth's shape, and by Aristotle's time, it was an established fact among educated people. While many ancient cultures had flat Earth cosmologies, the idea mostly vanished from scholarly thought for over 2,000 years. The modern flat Earth movement is a more recent phenomenon that gained traction in the 19th century and has seen a bizarre comeback online. Despite overwhelming evidence from physics, astronomy, and literally thousands of years of sailing around the world, not to mention countless satellite photos, the idea persists. It stands as the ultimate example of a theory that isn't just wrong, but was proven wrong millennia ago and simply refuses to fall off the edge of history. From phantom fire fuel to cosmic jello, the history of science is littered with brilliantly creative and often hilariously wrong ideas. But that's the beauty of it. Science is a process. It's designed to test, to challenge, and to throw out old ideas when new evidence comes along. What seems like obvious common sense to us today might look just as strange to people 500 years from now as mice popping out of bread does to us. So stay curious, keep questioning, and maybe, just maybe, be a little skeptical. Thanks for watching.